Let the church say amen again. God is good how often? All the time. Amen. Certainly, it is just one more blessing from the great God of heaven that he has blessed us to be here on this morning. I think all of y'all are pretty good, and I think I'm pretty good. But what can I tell you? None of us deserve the blessings. None of us deserve the love. None of us deserve the mercy of God. But I'm just sure enough glad that he decided to smile on me anyhow. I didn't do everything right. I didn't meet the mark, but still God just decided to smile down upon me. And I know I got about five or six people in the parking lot that can say, you know what, devil, you beat up on me Monday through Friday. Guess what? I had to struggle with you on Saturday, but I refuse to let the devil steal my joy. David said, this is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and we ought to be glad in it. I'm, I don't know about y'all, but any opportunity that I have to come and express to my God just how appreciative of what I am for what he has done in my life, something wrong as I said with a frog that won't praise his own little pad. Something's wrong with the child of God that won't bless the God that woke you up this morning, that started you on your way, put food in your table. You didn't make it here in your car and hope in a prayer. God put gas in your tank for you to get here and be here this morning. You got something to be thankful for. You got something to be thankful for on this morning. And I'm just so glad that in spite of, God has been good to us. You ever think about that places you've been, things you've been involved in, yet and still God said, you know what, that's my child. I'm not going to condemn them where they are, but guess what? I'm going to give them just a little bit more time. And, and let me tell you, I'm so glad that we serve a God. He got a long rope with this mercy and this grace. He'll, he'll let you get out just so far and let you really think that you're doing it on your own, that you're making it on your own, and you get out so far and he'll reel you right back on it. I'm so glad that God knows when and where to come and meet us during the circumstances of our life because he knows when it's getting just a little bit too hard for us to bear. So he got to come down and help us carry these heavy loads, heavy loads. Amen. God is good. God is good on this morning. So thankful to see such a, a good number of people that have come out here on this morning. We're so thankful for everyone that is here, especially for, and also for those that are watching us um, online via live stream on this morning. Glad that you have tuned in to be with us. And again, as has already been said, we hope you all are excited. I am. We, we hope you all are looking forward to next Sunday. We will be reopening the building for regular services, returning to Sunday morning Bible study as well as afternoon worship service. And again, just want to reiterate that the leadership is doing all things possible, doing all things necessary to make sure that you have a safe and a comfortable environment that you can come and worship in. So we pray that everyone would just, just get excited about that and come out um, because we still got work to do. Can I get one witness? We, 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 still, we still have a mission um, whether you recognize it or not you're supposed to be busy in the kingdom of God he's given all of us a job and a duty and I just pray that we'll get busy so we can make an impact for God amen amen we're going to be continuing um, a series of lessons that we've been in over these past five weeks um, but today we'll be in uh, Genesis chapter 13 Genesis chapter 13 we're going to begin at verse number five and um, I'm going to conclude at verse number 13 Genesis chapter 13 beginning at verse number five. That was a, a lady, an elderly lady, who one morning she woke up and she heard a commotion down in her living room. And as she got down there to the living room, she found that there was a burglar that had come in to rob her of her, of her possessions. And when she saw the burglar, she hollered out, Acts 2 and 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, the man just dropped everything that he had picked up and said that I give in. Well, the police had got there, and the police asked him, said, young man, why did you give up so easily? Man, she said she had an axe in 238, so I won't finna play with her. <laughs> Genesis chapter 13. Beginning at verse number five. You don't mess with nobody. They got an X and 238. You got to get up out of there. Amen. Genesis chapter 13. Beginning at verse number five. The Bible says, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together. 
for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou would take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou cometh unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and then separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tent toward Sodom. Verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. I want to give for um, our message on today something that we all know about. Family trouble. Family trouble. For Abram, everything was not smooth sailing. After his return to Canaan from his messed up trip, we'll say, in Egypt, there arises a conflict between himself and between his nephew by the name of Lot. It was a conflict that had serious ramifications and it had to be resolved. How this conflict was settled is what I want to focus on this morning. Just like Abram, there will be times in life where conflicts and trouble will arise in our lives as well. But the thing is, how you deal with conflicts and troubles reveals more about your character than you really want to admit. Because what you are when the pressure is on is what you really are. I'll say that one more time. What you are and how you respond when the pressure is really on is how you really are. Now, since that is true, let's take some, a moment to look into these verses this morning and notice some aspects of this story that speak into our lives on today. And the first thing that I want to look at is that both Abraham and Lot gain immense wealth and power where they were. They had some stuff. They weren't broke by a long shot. They had some stuff. Now, neither one of them was inherently wrong as long as they were controlled by the right spirit. What do you mean? It was good. There was nothing wrong with them accumulating all of the wealth and the things that they had. Nothing wrong with an individual accumulating all of the wealth and the material possessions that they can in this life. But the issue comes when your possessions begin to possess you. The issue comes when those things that you have have now gotten a hold on you. Now, that problem remained unresolved, and eventually it developed into a bone of contention. Can I tell you that when you don't deal with an issue, the issue later on down the road will become a bigger issue? When you don't deal with the ant hill, sooner or later you're going to find out that now you got a mountain that you got to deal with. Evidently, each one wanted the best grazing ground for their flocks and for their herds. But know this, trouble is always a certainty when the focus of life is removed from Jesus and is put on yourself. I said life will always be troublesome when you take your mind and your focus off Jesus and you place all the attention on yourself. I know that ain't never been you. I know you have never had the mindset that it's me, my, and I. What can I get? What can I attain? That is not what life is about. God created you and put you on this earth so that you could in turn worship and please him that created you. Now, how Abram and Lot responded to the crisis in their family says a lot about the character of each one of these men. If you want to know the true character of any person, just see how they respond during a time of crisis or during a time of conflict. Now, Abram, he displays a loving and gracious spirit when he deals with Lot. 
He gives a twofold reason as to why they should live in peace and why they should not be arguing. By the way, his reasons are valid for the church today. And number one is, we are brethren. I got one witness. I, I, I look. Number one reason he gives why there should be no contention between us, he says, we family. We kid folk. Your, your mama might, might, be, not, might not be my mama. Your daddy may not be my daddy. But the creator, the one that we all came from, we all have a common father that we all worship and adore. Now, Abram displays a loving spirit, and, and they should love and respect one another. Can I say that? At times, you may not always agree with somebody, but you are still supposed to love and you're still supposed to respect one another. Now, even in the best circumstances, trouble is always a possibility. I'll say that one more time. Even in the best of circumstances, trouble is always a possibility. Can I say this? In the church, there should be peace. In the church, there should be love. In the church, there should be tenderness between the members. But because we are sinful human beings, trouble often arises even among us. However, it is never right regardless of the reason. There is nothing so important that it should be allowed to tear up the work of the Lord and his church. And friends, he cannot bless in an atmosphere of discord and trouble. The best course of action is to forgive and forget. I say I, the, the best course of action is to forgive and to forget. Now, the number one reason he gave why they shouldn't be arguing, we can't, folks, it's a coffee. We relate it. And number two, the heathen are watching. Verse, the B part of verse 7 tells us that the Canaanites were living around them at this time. This presented a dual problem in the face of the conflict. First, it placed both Abram and Lot in danger. If these warlike people saw an opportunity to attack them and take their possessions, that's exactly what they were going to do. And second, no doubt these people were interested in the God that Abraham was serving. They would evaluate, they would sit back and look at his religion by the effect that it had on his life. Now, can I say this to you this morning? The same problems confront the church in our day. When we fight, Satan is having a heyday. He's sitting back and he's laughing and saying, uh-huh, y'all thought you had it together. You thought you was doing pretty good. Now I got contention. Now I got discord in the house of the Lord. And the Satan just sit back with a smile on his face when he is allowed to scatter the flock of God. When we fight, the world sees our lack of love, our lack of tenderness, our lack of forgiveness, and they come to this conclusion. You know what? I'm better off out here where I am than they get mixed up in that Jesus business because y'all ain't nothing but a bunch of hypocrites in the first place. You ever heard that before? Yeah, you, you've heard that, heard that a time or two. Now, Abram, I respect him so much in this story because Abram willingly, they didn't have to argue about it, he willingly gave up his rights as the oldest of the family. He was, the, he, he was the uncle. He was the eldest of the family. He could have chosen first, but he yielded to Lot. And, you know, sometimes instead of getting in a big old argument with somebody, the best thing to do is just to agree, to disagree. The best thing to do is just to say, hey, you know what? This problem doesn't have to be as big as it can be. We're just going to leave that 
right here. He willingly said, you know what? You choose what you want. You go to the left, I go to the right. You go to the right, I go to the left. Because there is nothing that is so important that we got to sit here arguing and mad with each other. If, if you got to go over there and I got to stay over here, we not speak to each other anymore just for us to have some kind of peace. That's exactly what we're going to have to do. Now, this is something that we see often, but it is what believe it is that this is not something that you see often, but it's what believers ought to do. He willingly put the happiness of Lot above his own. He put Lot's desires above his own. We should never get this compromise the truth to please anybody. The truth. We should never compromise the truth to please anybody. But there are times when we should give into the wishes and the needs of others if it's going to keep down confusion. How could Abram so easily give up the best of the land to Lot? Abram knew that his cause was safe with God. The reason he didn't worry about what part of the land he was going to choose is because God had already promised to give all of it to Abram. That's why, that's why he wasn't worried about it. There's no need in us sitting here in argument. You might sit there, you might be renting it for a little while, but my dad has already told me he's going to give me that land. The Lord had already promised to give it all to him. We saw that back in Genesis chapter 12. And notice that when a believer's faith really trusts in God, then you can afford to hold the possessions and rights very loose. So you don't put too much stock in material possessions. After all, you realize it don't belong to you anyway. It all belongs to God. Abram did not get mad. He did not get bitter, and he did not get puffed up when he did not get his way. I'll say that one more time. Abram did not get mad. He did not get puffed up or upset simply because things did not go his way. He simply did everything in his power to work out the problem. That's the way of Christ. That's the will of God for our lives. Whenever there's an issue that comes between us and somebody else, we, the only thing we ought to be doing is trying to figure out how can we resolve the issue. Now, on the other hand, Lot made his decision based upon what his eyes told him. He claimed the land that appeared, that looked to be the best for raising flocks and herd. He did not ask God if he could have the land. He did not consult with God to see if that's where the Lord wanted him to go. He just looked until he saw what pleased him. And that is what he chose. He gratified his flesh. He did just what Eve did in the garden. He allowed his flesh to live for him. That, that Lot must have fallen in love with that country that he had went to. And he chose what he did because it reminded him of Egypt. You know, it is a dangerous thing to live to fulfill the appetites and the lusts of your flesh. Because if you've ever tried it, you'll realize you can never really satisfy your flesh. The said that your flesh may say, you know what? I just want one chip out the bag. But anybody that's ever got a chip out the bag know that you can't just have one chip out the bag. That when you get one, that taste of that one is going to give you the desire for another one. And, and the desire for another. You walk up to somebody and say, hey, man, let me get some of them chips. They come put one chip in your hand. You get upset. You get mad. Why you got to be like that? Why you got to be so stingy? Because I can't survive off just one. That's the way that it is with your flesh. Once you get consumed in sin, you're always going to be led to, oh, it's almost like a drug addict. What satisfied them the first time. It's not going to satisfy them the next time. 
So now I got to do just a little bit more than what I did the last time to get that same feel and that same rush that I had on the last time. That's how it is with your flesh. Once your flesh gets a little bit, it's always going to want just a little bit more. Now, Lot did not respect Abraham at all. Lot's choice demonstrated a total lack of regard for the needs of Abram. Evidently, he didn't respect his uncle at all. Lot lived to please one person, and that was Lot. You ever been there? I, I, have any of us, any of us ever guilty of being self-centered? Any, any of us ever been guilty of not considering other people, but I always want other people to consider us. We ever, anybody ever been guilty, anybody ever not supported something simply because you weren't going to be on front line? Anybody, anybody ever said, you know what, anybody ever went out of their way to tarnish something simply because wasn't nobody going to give you no recognition? Anybody, anybody ever been there? And I know we've all been there because we're human. We've all been there because we're all human. And every now and then, when you're not careful, you find yourself getting a little bit selfish. You find yourself saying, you know what? I'm going to take the best and you can have the rest. And isn't that funny how the place that he chose end up tearing his whole family apart? And, and we keep coming back, we keep coming back to this principle that whenever you leave God, you find yourself going downhill. Whenever you leave God, whenever you get off the path of God, you find yourself going down a downward path. He went so far down that he at one time had his tent pitched towards Sodom. And evidently, Elder Dixon, at some point in time, they moved on one of the main streets in Sodom. His daughters went to Sodom High. His wife joined the Sodom's women's circle. He was in the Sodom's men's club. They had became so intertwined and had got so caught up in the things of Sodom. And let me tell you, child of God, you can only hang around sin and temptation for so long. And I don't care how good or how strong you might be, eventually that sin and that temptation is going to appeal to your flesh. And that tent that you once had, pitched on the outside is now on the main street on the inside and you see how even his wife got so caught up in it my sister that when I told us hey we got to go don't look back don't look behind man you know what we got to get out of here she was so consumed in what she had been involved in that she said you know what I can't leave all that behind without looking back just one more time. And all of us know that her one last time was her very last time. It was her very last time. How many of us has that been? How many of us that has that been? Well, you know, there were some situations. There were some relationships. There were some environments that you knew you needed to get out of. But because it was pleasing to your flesh and to your, your, the, the desires of your heart, you said, you know what, I'm going to stick around just a, just, a, just a little bit longer. Almost like Pharaoh, he said, you know what, I want one more night with the frogs. Just, just one more night, one more night with the frogs. And do you see sometimes the things that you as a human being are willing to do just to please your flesh? We'll lie to please our fish. We'll do underhanded deeds just to please our flesh. We'll go above and beyond to get those things that we desire. What about what your daddy desires? What about the things that your father desires? He desires that you will live for him. Are you living for him this morning? 
He desires that you would serve him. Are you serving him this morning? I, I, I ain't talking about a Sunday morning service because this is easy to do. Anybody can drive up here and sit here on Sunday morning and look like a Christian. Anybody can do this and that and appeal to be and claim to be what they might not be. But to be a true Christian, to be a disciple of Christ is one that the Bible refers to that denies their flesh. And after you've denied your flesh, after you've denied yourself, you're willing to pick up your cross. And after you've picked up your cross, you're willing to follow him. Now, Lot left the life of a pilgrim behind, and he settled down among the sinners of Sodom and Gomorrah. He raised his family there, and as I said, he also lost his family and his testimony in that place. Genesis chapter 19 refers to Lot as a just man, but 2 Peter 2 and 8 lets us know, however, that is no way for a believer to live. Look at Lot. Lot's way of reacting to trouble is the way that many Christians today choose in our day. These men needed to separate. But Lot chose the wrong path, and he chose it with the wrong attitude. Have you ever told somebody that you forgive them, but you forgave them with the wrong attitude? H have you ever apologized to somebody, but you apologized with the wrong attitude? His choice led him down, and it cost him plenty. But you look at Abram's choice, brought him blessings from God. I want to say to you today that if you had to be honest this morning and compare yourself to one or two of these men, who would it be? Abram, who took last place so that another person can be first place? Or Lot, who grabbed all that he could for himself? without regard for anybody else. I think we could all use help in the area of responding to conflict and trouble on this morning. The way to receive that help is to admit the need and to ask God to help us. Some here this morning are dealing with issues this morning. You'll be surprised how many of us here right now have ought with people, and we've forgotten what the ought is about. You'd be surprised how many people this morning woke up with a frown on their face because they're still upset and mad about, some, about what somebody did or said about them five and ten years ago. You, you still got people that don't want to speak to their brothers and sisters in Christ Simply because one Sunday morning you came by me and you didn't shake my hand and I felt like you had an attitude with me. And I've been walking around all these years upset not really knowing if there was an issue between us or not. But it's just the way that I perceived it. If you have an issue, if you have an out between you and somebody this morning, Come on, Come on. friends, Come on. let it go. Let go and let God handle the situation. Do you see how this story could have went in a totally different direction? If Abram would have said, you know what, man, you don't know you, man, look, I'm, I'm your uncle. I'm going to take this and you get what I give you. And they could have stood right there all their days mad and fighting with each other. Oh, who's going to get this and who's going to get that? But we got to be reminded just as they were reminded that the Canaanite and the Perizzite also dwell in the land. What are you saying, preacher? That when we quarrel amongst each other, our adversary, the oh, devil, yeah. is going to make sure that he televises the issues that you have going on yes, 
so that now it diminishes the witness that you are able to have to other people. So I don't care what issue that we have. I don't care what ought that we have. We ought not never let the sun go down on our rail. We ought not... We ought not never leave each other in a bad spirit. I might not like what you said. I might not agree with everything that you believe in. But guess what? At the end of the day, you are my brother and you are my sister. And because God loves you, I ain't got no other choice but to love you. If God can forgive me for all the low down, underhanded things that I have done, surely I can forgive my brother and my sister for the all that they have against me. And in closing, I say this. How can we say that we love God? Somebody you ain't never seen, but hate your brother and sister that you see on a daily basis. We better learn how to love. We better learn how to forgive. I believe it was Florida's own Betty Wright, Elder Denson, that said, if you learn this secret, how to forgive, a longer and a better life you'll live. <laughs> if you learn the secret, how to let go and let God. Because I don't know about y'all, but if you realize when you walk around mad, it, whatever you are feeling on the inside, it got a way of showing up on the outside. And you're 25 walking around here looking like you're 50 because you got so much anger and so much resentment and animosity on the inside of you. Let me tell you, there's nothing that anybody can say or do that's worth me walking around and missing out on the blessings of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then on the other hand, since we live a life that is fading and passing by, the writer says that these lives that we live, it's but a vapor. It appears for a little while, and soon it'll vanish away. And since we are living in what we call the last days, been in now, Sister Coffee, over some 2,000 years, since we've been in the last days, living in the last days, why would I want to walk around mad and upset with somebody, knowing that if I die in my sin, where God is, I cannot go. Look, look, look. I would much rather stop my own self from making it in than to allow what somebody else did or said to stop me from making it into heaven. So, church, today, let us learn how to let it go. Let us learn how to forgive one another. Just think about it. If God can forgive you with all the stuff that you done done. And I ain't got to call the road because don't nobody know what you done like you know what you done. Because you was there when you did what you did, how you did it, when you did it, what time you did it. You was there. Don't nobody else know like you know. You know how many times you've had to go before God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. You know how many times you've had to go before God and say, Lord, I know I said I wasn't going to do it again. Lord, I know I said I'd never be back at this place again, but Lord, here we are. Back at this place again. Lord, you know my heart. You know that I'm striving. You know that I'm trying. People that you deal with may not be on the level spiritually that you are on. So that's why you can't be so short-fused with people. What if God had a short fuse with you? You've been down a long time ago. That's why you got to learn not to be so, so short-fused and quick-tempered with people that are taking just a little bit longer to grasp it and to get it than others are. You got to be what the Bible calls long-suffering. Yes, not only do you have to be long-suffering, but we got to be patient with one another. Because if you think back just a few days, somebody had to come along and be patient with you. And let us get out of the place in our mind where we have arrived, where we've made it, we've studied all we need to study, heard all the preaching that we need to hear. Let us get away from that because can I tell you, you ain't going to have enough until you reach that other city on the other side. You ain't, 
You'll never have done enough. You'll never have served enough until that day when God calls and you got to answer. All of us are acquainted with some kind of family trouble. All of us got that one cousin. When family union come around, take my purse in the kitchen. Go in there and put it in the cabinet under the, under the sink. Uh, all of us, all of us got that cousin. We see them outside in the store. Child, come on. I don't want them to see me. Come on, before, before they see me up here. We, are, we all got those, those people that we try to avoid. But have you ever thought that your Christian witness might be all that they need? Have you ever thought that spending just a little bit of time studying or, or conversating with that person might just be what they need? That you'll go from hiding your purse to child, go get my purse. You'll, you'll, you'll change it up because that person has had a change in their life. Let's be patient with one another. Let's love one another. And can I tell you, if we show love, if we show patience, and kindness to one another, people will see that. And they'll say, you know what? I want to serve that God that you're serving. I want to serve the Jesus that you're serving. I want some of whatever it is that you got. Because apparently it's working for them. We got to let our light shine, church. And the way we let it shine is the way that we conduct and the way that we live our lives. And always be mindful that you got an unseen audience. I'm sure when Moses killed that man, he thought didn't nobody see him. That's why he was looking around, you know, without looking up, you know, making sure didn't nobody see him. But there was somebody that saw what he did. Can I tell you something? Wherever you are, whatever company you're in, you never stop being a child of God. You never stop being a Christian. You can't get up in the morning and say, you know what? I'm going to put my Christianity here on the dresser for the day I pick it up when I get back home. You cannot do it like that. So everywhere you go, you're a Christian. Every company that you keep, you are a child of God. And somebody that don't know God ought to be able to look in the crowd and say, that one right there belongs to God. That one right there belongs to God. So let us, let us be grateful this morning. Because you have been a recipient of mercy. Because you have been a recipient of grace. Because you have been a recipient of another chance. Let us be willing to in turn give that to our family. Give that to our friends. Give that to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because no matter how good things may seem, trouble will always be arising from somewhere. And when trouble arises, we know how to handle it with love and with kindness here on this morning. Um, so if you are here on this morning and, and you are, are not a child of God, you're not a Christian, you find yourself outside of the ark of safety on this morning. As I've already mentioned, we live in a world that is fading by every day. At this moment right now, do you realize that you are closer to your life's end than when you woke up this morning. Every, every, every minute of our life, time is swiftly passing by. And you know not the day, the Bible says, nor the hour when the Son of Man shall appear. That's why we encourage, the Bible says that we ought to work while it is yet day. For the night cometh where no man shall be able to do any work. Let us know when we get to the other side. That's all the work that you could have done. Everything that you're going to do, you got to do it on this side, in this body, in this life. And these things that we do in this life and in this body are going to be those things that are going to judge us in the last day. You ever, you, ever, you ever had a hair appointment or a doctor's appointment and something else came up, you might want to go play a couple holes of golf or something. So you say, you know what, I'm going to just put that off and I'll get them on tomorrow. And you call them and you say, you know what, Doc, I ain't going to be able to make it in today. Can you fit me in tomorrow? Doc says, sure, I got an 8 o'clock tomorrow. I'll fit you in. But do y'all know there's one appointment that's coming? <laughs> You're not going to be able to put it off. Yeah. You're not going to be able to say, you know what, devil? I, 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 told, I, I spoke to somebody in the way that I shouldn't have spoke to them last night. Let me go and tell them I'm sorry. And I can't. No! Well, you know what? I just lied to such and such, and they're about to make a mess out of it. Let me go back. Good. No. As 
like the man in the Bible where he told me, he said, he said, thou hast almost, thou hast persuaded me to become a Christian. Almost, almost, you almost got, I almost believe what you say. I'm almost willing to make a chance. And I'm sure Elder Coffey, he would have made that chance if he would have knew that this night, thou fool, your soul is required of thee. I'm sure, I'm sure if when you came into this world, God had put a little tag around your toe that said expiration date. And you knew when you was going to check up out of here, this parking lot be empty this morning. Why you say that, preacher? Because we set it up until the day before. And the day of, we'd be up in the church. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, for to the church I sin, repent, ask the church, pray for Lord, forgive me. Lord, I want you to help me. Lord, I want you, I want you to give me a little chance. Lord, don't, don't condemn me where I am. Lord, give me another chance. But because we don't know. And I'm glad he didn't tell us. Because it's going to be like a thief and a robber. You don't expect no thief to come. Who just sitting in the living room? I wonder what time the thief going to be here. No, Times 10 o'clock. The rob ain't got here yet. Nobody, nobody lives like that. You never expect it. And that's how the son of man will come back. The Bible says he's going to come like a thief in the night. You don't know when he's going to come. You don't know what window he's going to come through. You don't know going to come through the front door, the back door, side door. You don't know where he's coming. You just know that he's coming and you need to be expecting that. Let us live our lives in such a way that if God were to come at any given moment, we can say, as Paul said, you know what? I fought a good fight. My course, I finished it. My faith, I kept it. Henceforth, is laid up for me now a crown of righteousness. But guess what? It ain't exclusive to just me. But for all those that love Christ and his appearing, you can receive it as well. So if you're here this moment, this morning, you're not a child of God. You're not a member of the church of Christ. We plead with you today. Give yourself to God. We plead with you today. Don't let this opportunity and this moment pass you by. Not by accident that you are here on this morning. God purposely designed it for us to be together here on, on this morning. So my friend, if you are here today and you don't yet know God in the pardon of your sin, you come by hearing this word. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17 says, So then faith, come by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. After hearing, one must believe that same word that they've heard. After belief, it causes one to repent of their sins. What is repentance? Repentance is a change in my mind that produces a change in my action. After repentance, with my mouth I confess that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And after confession, you're willing to be baptized for the remission of your sin, have your sins washed away, eradicated, done away with, never to come up before you in this life and neither the life that is to come. And according to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord, not Trevante, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And if you're here this morning and you're already a Christian, but you're saying, you know what, preacher? I got some issues. I got some struggles. I got some troubles that I'm dealing with, man. I need somebody to pray for me. The prayers of the righteous, they still avail much. So if you are subject to the invitation, we beckon, we plead with you. Why not take this chance, this opportunity that you have right now as together we sing the song of invitation.